appreciate your participation today as we talk about uh, lithium ion battery hazards and solutions. Um, my name is Dan Miller, as Fernand said, I, I'm an encapsulator specialist in uh, the state of Nebraska in the U.S. And uh, I, I cover about a five state area in the central part of the USA. And uh, my background is in, in the fire service. I spent about 40 years in the fire service in uh, metropolitan class cities, as well as small communities, uh, both career and volunteer fire departments and everything in between. So uh, a little bit of a hazardous material background as well uh, and some teaching and things like that. So what, I, what we want to focus on today, though, is uh, lithium ion battery hazards and uh, how they're impacting us all and how they're going to impact us all as we uh, continue to move in that direction globally. And uh, there's definitely some unique hazards about lithium ion batteries that, that we all need to be aware of in uh, no matter what walk of life we, we come from. So Hazard Control Technologies is located in Fayetteville, Georgia, just outside Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, but we do have a worldwide presence and distribution network. Uh, we manufacture uh, fluorine-free F500 encapsulator agent technology. And uh, although it's manufactured here in the U.S., we do have a worldwide distribution network uh, in uh, North America, Asia, South America, Australia, Europe, and Africa. And pretty much no matter where you're at, uh, uh, you can get access to F500 uh, just by mostly by contacting uh, Hazard Control Technologies, and we'll put you in touch with the right uh, distributor. <clears throat> so our focus today, again, is on uh, lithium-ion batteries and the hazards surrounding lithium-ion batteries. Lithium-ion batteries are really in, in so many devices nowadays and in, in all aspects of our lives, and uh, uh, most people don't think about them. Uh, the general public usually doesn't think about them until there is a problem. They just use the the item that they purchased uh, and sometimes run into a few problems with those. But there's really an issue with uh, the cradle to grave aspect of lithium ion batteries. So from when the point that they are manufactured till they are used, charged and discharged potentially thousands of times, and then when they are discarded or recycled, uh, that becomes an issue as well. And, and that's a growing issue as, as the volume of lithium ion batteries uh, uh, continues to grow and, and will grow much more rapidly in the next 10 years. <clears throat> so there's a big cultural footprint or a big cultural impact already uh, worldwide with lithium ion batteries. They can be found in almost every every part of our lives. Uh, however, some of the biggest current consumers of the technology are business uh, in the form of cell phones, laptops, tablets, uh, uh, electric vehicles. They're starting to get into electric vehicle fleets for, for business use. Uh, and then the general public, of course, again, tablets, cell phones, but also uh, micro mobility devices and uh, uh, transportation uh, and vehicles. And we'll talk about the impact of that on residential housing and uh, how the micro mobility devices are catching fire very rapidly and cutting off egress out of residential housing, especially uh, the large multi-residential housing that you find in the larger cities. <clears throat> uh, the transportation industry, uh, mass transit, uh, fleets, airplanes, over-the-road trucks, they're all taking on uh, uh, lithium-ion battery-powered units, and uh, that uh, manufacturing part of that industry is growing as well to keep up with the demand. Uh, power grid itself, uh, energy storage systems like you see in the photograph on the right, um, uh, those energy storage systems are, are starting to uh, gain a bigger footprint uh, in the electrical grid or the storage of energy during uh, hours. You'll see there's a solar field behind that energy storage system. So during the day when the sun's out, 
the batteries are, are charging. And then at night, we're using the energy out of the batteries. So, uh, and, and that not only powers the grid, but also some private facilities that are large that need extra power at certain times of the day and to save money on energy as well. They use energy storage systems. Healthcare industry, uh, there's hundreds, if not thousands of different types of port portable medical devices and patient transport devices that are now pow powered by lithium ion batteries. Uh, and those items are in every hospital, every uh, clinic, and uh, their footprint is, is constantly growing as well. Fortunately, with most of these devices, they have a, a really good safety record, but just with the increased volume, we're going to run into problems here and there. And, and the problem, for example, in the healthcare industry, the power industry, is whenever a device has a problem in that environment, we're, we're threatening critical infrastructure <clears throat> as well as people. Uh, the construction industry, uh, cordless tools are, are a huge uh, benefit to the construction industry. They use them each and every day. Uh, but now they're also getting into lithium ion uh, energy storage at construction sites. So they'll have a small battery energy storage system to power tools off the grid uh, for as long as the workday lasts. So it, it's an alternative to a, a gasoline or diesel power generator on site. They'll just have a, a large battery system. So those are taking off and, and we're finding more and more of those as well. And <clears throat> the industries that become impacted by uh, the growth of lithium ion batteries includes the automotive industry uh, and not only uh, on the user end of it, but uh, the manufacturing side. So almost every manufacturer that I know of from the smallest vehicle or uh, even lawn equipment that you can you can buy up to the biggest vehicles like school buses, over the road trucks. They're all going the way of electric vehicle, at least research and development. Uh, soon they will all have some units on the street. <clears throat> um, energy, the energy industry, the power generation industry, as we already mentioned, battery energy storage from uh, solar and wind fields. Uh, being stored in battery energy storage systems for uh, 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 off hours use for when they're not generating energy from wind or solar. Uh, the shipping industry is greatly affected by lithium ion batteries uh, from uh, maritime industry, uh, the intermodal shipping industry, rail, uh, uh, over the road trucks, et cetera, as batteries are being shipped from their manufacturing point to terminals and out to end users. And then also, as you'll see here shortly, shipping them from end user collection sites back to recyclers uh, is also an issue. <clears throat> uh, so we're having more and more shipping fire challenges from lithium ion batteries. Uh, government, uh, as governments take on fleets, uh, you'll see the, the school buses there. That's a government function here in the U.S. at least. Uh, governments are buying fleets of electric vehicles to replace gasoline and diesel fuel powered vehicles in some cases, even, even fire trucks. So that's going to be a, a growing industry and a growing threat, not necessarily due to the track record, but just due to the volume we're going to have much more volume over time. And uh, when the fires in these uh, types of vehicles actually burn, it's a it's a different pattern than we're used to. So we're, we're having to learn how to fight those fires differently. <clears throat> uh, manufacturing industry uh, from manufacturing devices that are powered by lithium ion batteries, manufacturing with lithium ion batteries, to the material handling like fork trucks, forklifts, et cetera, robots, things like that that are powered by lithium ion batteries within the, within the manufacturing facilities as well. Fleet operators uh, impacted obviously uh, uh, when lots of vehicles are charging at any one time or parked next to each other, uh, somewhat of a hazard 
there from one vehicle to another as uh, one vehicle can catch on fire and take out an entire row or fleet. Um, and then just training operators of those vehicles how to recognize problems as they're using those vehicles on the street. It's a it's it's a different kind of education than they would get with a with a internal combustion engine powered vehicle. <clears throat> Emergency response industry obviously heavily impacted by this. Uh, we're all having to learn, like I said, a little bit different way to approach these fires as well as the situations in which they're found. It can create uh, uh, a much more uh, significant hazard, but but also it's just different than we're than we're used to dealing with. And if we learn how to approach them, we'll, we'll be fine over time. <clears throat> and then one of the big industries impacted by lithium ion batteries is the insurance industry, as things like recycling facilities and so forth uh, uh, catch fire due to the, the presence of lithium ion batteries, the insurance industry gets impacted because they they have to, uh, number one, suffer the loss and then adjust to it with premiums and so forth and figure out how to respond to that. So with all of these, education is essential to reducing that loss and the casualties from lithium ion battery related emergencies. And it's something we're all going to have to adjust to. So lithium ion batteries themselves, uh, <clears throat> they're specified based on their, their size uh, and, and voltage and amp hours and watt hours to meet the demand of whatever they're going into as far as a device. So if you look at the, the cell phone battery, it's a flat device or a laptop or tablet battery, typically a flat device, uh, an envelope style battery so that it can be uh, low profile. Uh, uh, EV cars, there's typically going to have a cylindrical kind of a battery in them, typical to what you might see in a flashlight. Uh, but there's just thousands of them grouped together to create the amp hours and watt hours that are needed to meet the demand. <clears throat> and then for an e-bike or a micro mobility device, you're going to have a battery module that's filled with uh, typically cylindrical batteries uh, to meet the voltage that you need. And when uh, manufacturers or engineers are specifying the batteries that get used in the devices they're uh, designing. They they have to look at the demand that's going to be used over a period of time and the usage pattern, how many cycles they want it to last uh, as far as charging and discharging, how long they want the, the device to be able to be unplugged and on its own uh, and, and working in the field without being charged and base the battery size and voltage uh, off of that. So we have those three basic form factors, uh, pouch, cylindrical, and prismatic. And our next slide here shows you kind of the difference between those. So in the image on the right, you have the envelope or pouch style that would, might be typical of a, a tablet battery or something like that, a flat profile. And then you have the prismatic, are those little boxes and they group the boxes together to create not only the voltage that's needed in either parallel or series circuit, uh, but also the duration or the watt hours or amp hours that you're going to get out of those batteries uh, so that you can uh, use your device over the specified period of time without failure. And then on the very right, you have an e-bike battery uh, and that Battery is in a module or a battery pack, you might call it. And inside of that pack are cylindrical batteries. Those are an 18650 cell is what they're called. Um, <clears throat> they're 18 millimeters in diameter and 65 millimeters long. So they're like uh, uh, an e-cigarette battery is basically all they are. But they're, they're grouped together in such a fashion to develop the voltage and amperage needed uh, to power the device. And then you'll notice there's a circuit board there with it. That circuit board is the battery management system. And that keeps those batteries from, from being overcharged or too rapidly discharged and helps prevent a fire. <clears throat> now, there are three top most popular battery chemistries on the market today. And that includes LFP or LIFEPO, you might call it, lithium iron phosphate uh, batteries is one chemistry, very popular. And then there's uh, the nickel 
uh, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide, or LM or N NCM for short. Uh, kind of hard to spit out all those words at, together at once. Uh, and then there's the NCA or the lithium, nickel, cobalt, aluminum. Uh, those are probably the three more most popular right now. However, there's always new battery chemistries under development. There's some. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different stuff under development to try to 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 tackle the safety issue as well as longevity issue. <clears throat> there is one common denominator though, and that's the common hazards of all of these batteries, at least the ones that are on the market so far, and that's stored energy, which can shock you. And anytime there's stored energy, there's the ability to start a fire with that stored energy. Rapid thermal runaway, and we'll talk about what thermal runaway is and, and what its definition is uh, shortly. But most of you have probably heard that if you're on this on this webinar. And then there's the smoke and gas emission from the batteries. Uh, the smoke is toxic and the, and the smoke and gas combination is also flammable and explosive. And then of course, fire itself. <clears throat> so uh, there's a few common ways that batteries fail. Uh, lithium ion batteries have about four different failure modes, but each one of those failure modes has a root cause or several root causes. So the first one is short circuiting. That's simply taking the, the positive terminal and shorting it to the negative terminal. And that can happen either externally to the battery or if the battery has poor battery chemistry or maybe gets some trauma, uh, or gets dendrites due to age. And dendrites are like little stalagmites or stalactites that accidentally connect the layers inside of the battery together and short circuit it internally. And that causes the batteries to overheat and go into thermal runaway <clears throat> and cause an unstable circuit as well. Uh, uh, in many cases, I would say in most cases, when that occurs, either due to trauma or uh, uh, dendrites or something like that, the battery simply goes dead and it's not a problem. But on occasion, they'll go into thermal runaway and, and cause a fire. Uh, trauma, drops, and damage uh, from uh, being crushed, creased, punctured, uh, run over by uh, heavy equipment, uh, dropped from a ladder if you're using a cordless tool and landing on the concrete, all those kinds of things cause trauma to a battery. And due to the fact that those layers are very, very close together already, uh, once you physically force those layers together due to trauma, you're going to have basically an internal short circuit, overheating, and thermal runaway. Uh, overcharging is another failure mode. Uh, overcharging a lithium ion battery uh, causes it to overheat. So overcharging happens a couple of different ways. Number one, it could be a, a a higher voltage than the battery is rated for due to something like a, uh, someone using a charger that's not designed to go with the battery equipment that they're charging. Uh, maybe they they bought uh, an illegitimate charger or they, they homemade or modified a charger and they're charging it at too high of a voltage than, than the batteries were meant for. And then the other way is that they're charging too fast. So um, it's pretty easy to uh, uh, charge a battery too fast if uh, if you have a, a charger that's rated at a higher amperage than the batteries are supposed to accept, especially when uh, maybe the the battery management system circuit board on the batteries that uh, packed itself may be compromised. You can have a you can have a, a integrated circuit chip that is supposed to act as a voltage regulator that that goes out of whack and causes that as well. <clears throat> Um, uh, overheating, uh, uh, due to too rapid of a discharge is pretty common. So, uh, a, a short circuit is an example of, uh, too rapid of a discharge, but also if the batteries just used, uh, uh, I guess, in too aggressive a man of a manner, then, a, then the battery can accept, uh, the generation and, and then the subsequent, uh, management of the heat that's developed can cause the batteries to overheat. And that doesn't always occur 
uh, acutely in one incident. It can occur uh, chronically with many overheating incidents over time, which breaks down the, the layers and the protective uh, layers between the electrolytes and the other materials in the battery and causes eventually dendrites, short circuiting, etc. <clears throat> so there's a lot of, although there's only really four failure modes, there's a lot of reasons for it. There can even be a, a you know, maybe a, a, a bad day at the manufacturing facility causes a, a chemical issue or, or something to that uh, effect. I actually went to my first lithium ion battery incident in back in 2015, where uh, an e-cigarette uh, battery was in a charger and there were actually two of them in the charger. And for some reason it overheated. It was sitting on the, on the uh, person's uh, windowsill in their home. They went over and unplugged it and tried to rip the battery out, burnt their hand. It landed on the carpet, burned its way all the way through the carpet just because it was so hot, just one battery. And so we got to looking at the battery very, very closely. And it turns out that the that the colorful oil back wrapper that was on the battery, it actually gotten wrapped on it a little bit crooked or overheated and and twisted a little bit and ended up causing a short circuit between the positive and negative uh, terminals on the battery and went into instant thermal runaway before I even uh, understood what thermal runaway was. <clears throat> um, so one of the big things we look at, however, besides just the failure modes of individual cells or lithium ion batteries is uh, uh, the situations in which uh, uh, lithium ion batteries are being used in the situation in which emergencies occur. So we look at, at these images on the screen here. We've had several example, uh, uh, we've got several examples of uh, past failures of lithium ion batteries. The top left image up here is a, a battery energy storage system in Surprise, Arizona in 2019. Uh, that uh, they had a fire in that battery energy storage system. Fire department arrived. They waited a significant period of time, at least a couple of hours, for the interior to cool down and for it to kind of uh, uh, resolve itself, more or less. Finally, they went up and approached very carefully and opened the door. It ended up injuring uh, three firefighters, uh, one or two of them with career-ending injuries because it backdrafted. The buildup of gases in there uh, exploded as soon as it got uh, the necessary air to make an explosive mixture. <clears throat> uh, the middle, the top center uh, image up here of the parking garage collapse was actually in Norway. So another uh, lithium ion battery uh, EV powered vehicle caught on fire, caught several vehicles on fire nearby, overheated the structure in that concentrated area and caused a collapse. And then top right image is a recycling facility. Recycling facilities are uh, incidentally receiving lots of lithium ion batteries that are improperly discarded into the waste stream. And because of that, they're getting into the machinery in the lithium ion, or excuse me, into the recycling facility, catching the machinery on fire and or where the uh, uh, recyclables are dumped off the truck. They initially arrive. They can come in as what we call a hot load and or catch fire while they're still being processed into the facility in the middle of a pile of, of material. And uh, if the recycling facility especially is not occupied 24 hours a day, um, a fire can get away from them really, really quickly. But even if it is occupied, uh, a lithium ion battery can cause a flash fire, cause a piece of equipment to catch on fire that's processing it and, and turn out to be a pretty pretty large loss type of a fire and very, very dangerous with a lot of environmental impact as well, as you can see. <clears throat> now the image on the lower left is a, is a battery energy storage system. That's a smaller residential battery energy storage system that you might find inside of a home or an apartment uh, complex. And what that typically is used for is uh, when they have a solar panel on the roof and they need to store energy to use uh, during the evening when the sun is down, uh, then it 
takes energy off the battery. So it's a wall-mounted battery energy storage system. This one actually caught fire in, in uh, Pennsylvania and was actually extinguished by F500, which is the agent we manufacture. <clears throat> um, and it did not burn down the structure, which was very fortunate. Uh, and then in the center, bottom picture, we have a, a crash situation with an electric vehicle involved. Again, crash situation, trauma to batteries. Uh, the circuits are torn apart. You can have bare ends of circuits hanging out there that could easily get shorted together, cause an instant thermal runaway just in the, the post-incident handling of the vehicle and the vehicle parts. Um, uh, pretty common for, for fires to be initiated just by uh, post-incident handling or anywhere during patient rescue or extrication, they can just they can just take off and, and catch fire <clears throat> if they're not already on fire when, when the fire department arrives. And then the image on the lower right is all too common in, in uh, uh, larger cities, multifamily family residential complexes, large apartment buildings uh, where uh, the e-mobility devices, the e-bikes, the e-scooters, which are a wonderful way to get around a big city, uh, which take them into your apartment, charge them, something goes wrong, uh, it, it, the flash fire, you get warned by your smoke detector and woke up in the middle of the night, you don't know what's going on, and you open your, your bedroom door and, and your egress is cut off by this this rapidly growing flash fire. So a very, very uh, negative situation. So <clears throat> uh, I do wanna make this a little bit interactive. So uh, if you could, what I would love to see in chat from each of you is um, what industry uh, you're involved in primarily and what is your primary concern or need if you could put that in the same uh, chat message. So for example, uh, you're in the shipping industry and your primary concern is employee safety or facility protection, whatever it may be, or you're in uh, emergency response industry and your primary concern is firefighter effectiveness, uh, or you're in the uh, fire sprinkler industry and your primary concern is suppression systems. Just let us know what what your uh, industry is and what your primary concern is, why you joined us today, that would be very, very helpful. <clears throat> so this next uh, uh, item we have here, uh, uh, this just occurred a couple of weeks ago, June 28th, Lakewood, New Jersey. This is a UPS shipping terminal. And what they had happen was, uh, some lithium ion batteries came in that were packaged to go from wherever they were collected to a recycler. So these were batteries destined for a recycling facility. They were inside a 53 foot uh, trailer uh, backed up to the facility dock. And uh, there's some really excellent footage here. Somebody had a drone up right away. The fire department's just arriving and just getting set up. So this is a very, very early view of of this fire situation. From the inside, it doesn't look like it at this point. It's uh okay. Can you see the ceiling? Because I definitely have fire to uh, envision a conflict. Okay. Like we keep to his house. See the ceiling in here. We have to just climb up some uh, scaffolding and stuff. That truck's on fire. They just drove that away. You can actually see that firefighter there with the white hat, probably a chief, chief officer, gets in the truck and drives it away from the dock. Chief one engine, uh, five is on the way in. Uh, drop in line. Chief two is going to get the hydrant charged when we're ready. All right, come around to the seaside. I'm going to have you bring that line inside from the seaside. Copy that, on our way. Mike, do you have any fire inside, Ladder 5? I got fire inside, uh, mostly to the trailers. Fire apparatus laying in a supply line, 
if you look at the image as it goes, that, that supply line goes clear out to the street. Pretty long supply line. <clears throat> They're just getting set up here. I think they do a, you know, I wasn't there or anything, but it looks like they do a fairly decent job of laying in, getting set it up, set up, stretching lines, uh, and attacking the fire. Uh, they were on scene for five hours, so a uh, significant period of time for probably a small Dad. box of lithium ion batteries. So one of the things you'll notice here is <clears throat> this fire started on the exterior of the building in one of these trailers. So our sprinkler and suppression systems are not designed to defend the building from things on the outside of the building or, or cause and origins that are on the outside of the building. They're strictly designed for things that occur inside of the building. So it's something that we need to take another look at because this isn't the first one. If you look at the Plainfield, Indiana, uh, uh, Walmart distribution center fire from a couple of years ago, uh, 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 situations like that, uh, there are there are lots of situations that there are a lot of trailers on the outside of the building that can catch fire due to a building fire. And there are a lot of opportunities for trailers on the outside of the building to catch the building on fire. So be a, a, a interesting look at how do we defend the building from threats outside of the building? And the same thing going on in the lightweight apartment building uh, business uh, as people smoke on their balconies and, and catch the vinyl siding on fire. The sprinkler system doesn't handle that because it's not meant for the outside of the building. So we need to take another look at how we're suppressing fires uh, that could be a threat from the outside as well as the lithium ion battery threat in general from any kind of package on the inside, the flash fire capability, um, and how do we detect them fast enough to do something about it, and then how we go ahead and suppress that fire. <clears throat> So this is a, a recent fire in London, very typical. You have a, an e-mobility device here charging. Uh, could be the middle of the night. Uh, you don't get the luxury of determining when the fire starts, but you'll notice initially you've got smoke from uh, the beginning of the thermal runaway, which the smoke is toxic and it promotes fire growth. And then it goes into uh, thermal runaway and fire. As it goes into the thermal runaway, you'll notice how quickly the fire grows and how easily it could cut off your egress out of that apartment building. And that's why six people died in New York City in 2022 uh, and over 200 fires. And uh, I know they have the same problem in every big city, including London. <clears throat> So what are the solutions to a fire like this that grows that rapidly? That battery is actually burned up by the time the fire department gets anywhere near it. Um, and so the battery fire is not the issue anymore. The building fire is the issue and the trapped occupants are the issue. So there really has to be a, a, a global look at preventive measures such as bans on having those in your building at all, codes, code enforcement, faster responding residential sprinkler systems, water additives in the sprinkler systems. Uh, I did see something uh, just earlier today on, on LinkedIn where you can actually have a bike that's more or less in a, in a big protective bag with zippers. You drive it in there, you zip it up, and you charge it inside of this bag that uh, hopefully holds that, that flash fire inside of the bag at least long enough for you to get out of the building and, and warn everybody else to get out. So we have to start asking our, ourselves some questions here. Um, number one, uh, is our fire department prepared 
for these types of fires and the hazards that they produce and, and how they're caused and how to approach them. Uh, if we're running a fleet operation, is our team prepared uh, to prevent fires and to respond to small fires before they grow large? Um, if we're running an automotive repair facility, is our, our team of mechanics prepared to deal with fire situations and do they know how to prevent them? Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, if we work in a factory environment, is our workforce prepared to deal with, with the hazards and the threats? Is our facility prepared with the right types of uh, uh, suppressive equipment, whether it's fixed suppression or manual handheld suppression or both? Uh, is our facility able to be defended when we're when the facility is occupied as well as when the facility is unoccupied? Is our industry prepared? <clears throat> uh, as we're building out these new uh, wonderful devices that that power our grid, that power our lives, um, are we taking care to make sure that the solutions are built in? Um, are, are we uh, truly doing everything that we can? Are we just meeting minimum codes? Are we going the extra mile to make sure this, this item is going to be safe and not a problem? Uh, uh, what can we do to make sure that we're resilient against these fires? And something that I always have to remind myself of as I'm out teaching and training and consulting is that fires aren't always accidental. Sometimes they're on purpose. So you can have uh, arson, you can have uh, lone wolf attackers, you can have acts of war. They're all external causes. You can even have weather events like lightning strikes. And, and a lot of times our codes are, as well as our emergency preparedness efforts, are focused around accidental causes when we actually need to go a little further than that uh, uh, in our world. We always have. It's nothing new. But we're always under threat of external uh, forces that might intentionally start our facilities on fire or attempt to. <clears throat> And then is our community prepared? So if you look at the, the parking structure, for example, most of these parking structures are attached to critical infrastructure like hospitals, airports, large office buildings, uh, things that we need to function. Uh, so uh, is that parking structure protected from EV fires or even regular vehicle fires, but especially EV fires that could cause it to collapse? that could compromise the safety of the hospital and everybody in it? Uh, is it sprinklered at all? Uh, do we need to, in the meantime, before it's sprinklered and protected, do we need to make sure that no EVs enter that parking structure? What's our community doing from a community risk reduction uh, uh, perspective to prevent problems in the first place? <clears throat> and then as we move towards a more electric vehicle filled society, how are we going to protect this, this structure? What are we going to do in the next five or 10 years? Are we going to retrofit expressive systems into these facilities? Uh, or are we just going to let them age out and, and build new ones or burn down and build new ones? <clears throat> so how do most lithium ion batteries uh, start in the first place? So we mentioned something called the thermal runaway. <clears throat> So a thermal runaway, it's a chemical process that occurs within the battery. It produces heat and chemical gases very, very rapidly. Those gases are explosive and promote the growth of the fire. It develops a, a chain reaction that goes on. Uh, and uh, typically we think of a chain reaction as something that we can watch. And uh, like a domino effect that we can actually visualize and get out our stopwatch and time it with thermal runaway. It, in many cases, it happens so fast because electricity moves at the speed of light and and the heat pattern just follows it. <clears throat> so it can happen very, very quickly if you have a high state of charge above 50 percent, or it can happen a little bit more slowly if you have a low state of charge, it's just below 50 percent. Um, uh, the more thermal energy that's generated, however, the greater the impact on adjacent cells and the faster that heat moves from cell to cell to cell. So one cell will typically fail, go into thermal runaway, 
eject all of its uh, electrolyte out one end or the other or split open the side if it's a pouch and that catches fire uh that that heat has to go somewhere and the batteries are bundled or, or sandwiched together and so that heat goes into the adjacent cell and then it goes into thermal runaway so it, it cycles and it grows and it, if the batteries in the middle somewhere of, of a pack that that thermal runaway propagation is just going to grow outward from cell to cell to cell and keep involving more and more cells uh, simultaneously as it grows until we can intervene with it, cool it off, do something with that electrolyte to neutralize it and kind of reverse the, the heat generating situation, absorb the heat faster than it can be developed. <clears throat> The toxic gases that come off of these, there's hundreds of them, both your typical ones like carbon monoxide, which comes off of almost every fire, hydrogen cyanide, uh, but also hydrogen fluoride, which is it's toxic at a very low level. Um, and then uh, all of these gases, however, are just free radical uh, developed uh, volatile organic compounds that uh, uh, are very, very flammable as that smoke and gas is developed, especially in an enclosed area. You can have what's called a partial volume deflagration or a full volume def deflagration as the building uh, fills with the smoke and gases from a battery that's maybe not, uh, that's maybe 30 to 50 percent charged. And then all of a sudden someone comes along, gives it uh, a breath of fresh air. You get that proper mixture and you already potentially have an ignition source there in, in the batteries themselves. So then you can end up with a deflagration or an explosion and injure firefighters, injure occupants of buildings, catch the building on fire, damage the building. Uh, so those off gases are not only uh, uh, toxic, but they're also flammable and cause the damage to grow. <clears throat> so this battery module is out of a, of a Chevy Volt. Um, and what I want you to observe about this battery fire is, number one, the extreme volume of gases and smoke that are produced. So if this was in a single car or two car residential garage, um, imagine how much smoke could build up over that time. And remember, uh, even while you're sleeping, this gas is very, very flammable and could reach the right mixture at any moment. You pretty much already have the ignition source there. So. Uh, and then the other thing I want you to look at is the, the pattern of the burning, which is unique for lithium ion batteries in that is in that one cell burns out, the electrolyte gets exhausted, the fire dies down a little bit, catches the next one on fire, it's exhausted, and then all of a sudden it grows from one battery at a time to two at a time to four at a time to eight at a time, and it gets more and more intense the entire time. <clears throat> So the, the, the total heat release of an EV fire is really not much different than it is of a, than an internal combustion engine vehicle fire. However, the pattern of that heat release is what's vastly different. Number one, you have those jetting flames. Those jetting flames come out from underneath of the vehicle typically or the wheel wells and they go laterally. If it's in a parking structure or parked next to other vehicles, it catches them on fire very, very rapidly, and down the line it goes. Um, it's in a residential parking garage. It could catch the structure on fire very quickly, and then you've got a structure fire with an EV in it. Um, very rarely do electric vehicle fires occur where there are no exposures. They don't happen in the middle of empty parking lots very often. Occasionally they do, but not very often. Typically there are exposures either around the vehicle or in the vehicle in the form of people. So uh, 
You can't just opt to not put it out very often. <laughs> How are batteries constructed? So battery construction is typically in layers. Uh, in the case of a cylindrical battery like this 18650 cell, um, there's a layer of uh, different plastics, metals, and other synthetic components. You've got a carbon core uh, and then some copper, a separator that's made out of different types of plastics and membranes, which are typically proprietary to whoever's manufacturing the battery because that's their that's their point of pride right there is the separator as well as the liquid electrolyte and how to make that battery better, how to make it have more voltage and more amp hours. That's that's the the secret sauce. So you have those different layers in there is what call in what's called a jelly roll. So uh, that's a slang term in the industry that they're manufactured. They put that jelly roll together, stuff it into a canister, and you have an 18650 cell with a, a negative terminal on one end and a positive terminal on the other. And then typically an 18650 cell is around 3.8 volts, but you can get them up to four or a little more than four volts. And uh, you'll see the one in the in the illustration is 1.5 amp hours, but the one down here on the bottom is 3.0 amp hours or 3,000 milliamp hours. It's the same figure. So this was an early start up here in the uh, in the drawing with the 1.5 amp hours, but as battery technology has developed, they've getting more and more amp hours out of a 18650 cell. Well, that's great if you're driving a, an EV car, but it's bad if you're a firefighter <laughs> because you got that much more energy to contend with and wait for it to, you know, subside. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so typically on one end or the other, you'll see this one down here. It's got a vented negative terminal or anode, uh, and it's got a little bit of a gap under there to let the electrolytes and gases out when it becomes overheated, which is really a good feature. Otherwise, it would split open down the side as it's overheating and directly drive that heat into the cell next to it. <clears throat> uh, as battery technology manufacturing uh, evolves, they're getting more and more creative about venting the batteries, at least in a, in a manner that they won't eject quite as much material uh, and or become shrapnel. <clears throat> So this video shows several different cells and I'll pause and illustrate a little bit, but uh, it's just a video I grabbed off of YouTube. It's very good and it's very uh, indicative of how the batteries act. He starts out with a single 18650 cell and overheats it, or 2170. And it just rockets off. So next one, they, they hold down with a, they hold down with a C-clamp so it doesn't turn into a rock. So that single cell fails, the electrolyte spews out the end, catches on fire, the event's over. All right? You pack, you pack dozens or hundreds or even thousands of those side by side in a module that heat doesn't have anywhere to go but into the adjacent cells. In this one, they put a flame arrestor material in the end of the tube. So the flame comes out a little bit more slowly and controlled. It's on top of your hat. That's just a little candle flame. It's like a little Benson burner. It's still flaming. It's still flaming. It's not violent. <laughs> The flame arrestor does help control the jetting flames. That's just a little candle flame. It's like a little Benson burner. It's still flaming. It's still flaming.
Now we're going to get into multi cells. So there's six 2170s here in a little box. I think it's over. The first box, the first fire is out. Oh, there it is. Now this is the same box, same number of batteries, but the same arrestor material is installed. Well, the phone's still there. That's only one of six. does it's a great it's a great video because you can really see up close what's happening and the and more or less the, the chemical chain reaction that's taking place and the resulting forces now you take that box times a hundred or a thousand you got to like do it not typically all on fire at the same time it's going to continue to be on fire until uh, some kind of intervention happens or it burns out. So uh, uh, we talked about the energized environment. We talked about uh, the off-gassing potential. Um, so a lower state of charge results in uh, more gases being produced than initially flame. Uh, once the flame does become visible, you can be you know, at least fairly certain that more gas that comes out of it's going to immediately catch on fire and not be such an explosion hazard. But in the absence of flame at a low state of charge, that buildup of gas can result in an explosion. So this video is a fire in Colorado. Happened a month, month and a half ago. It's actually a hybrid Jeep. And in the hybrid Jeeps, they're starting to use lithium ion batteries rather than uh, nickel metal hydride. So what happens here is actually a pretty like a cold fire situation. But as the fire department approaches, the garage door blows off the structure. <clears throat> so the firefighters were actually inside. We were outside. It was more or less as soon as they opened that interior door to that to that garage, they gave it a little a little bit of air that it needed. <clears throat> so understand that the situation as you approach it is going to determine tactics. They're not all gonna be the same or require the same solution. So <clears throat> let's transition now into fire suppression uh, and the different fire suppression solutions that are available. Uh, obviously, we manufacture one, but I, I would enjoy your questions about the other ones that are out there. Uh, there's no one-size-fits-all solution, and a lot of these different tools and technologies can work together to answer the different tactical situations. <clears throat> 
as well as the fire protection industry, uh, shipping industry, et cetera, if you have questions. So we manufacture an encapsulator agent that's called F500. An encapsulator agent, uh, it, it, they conform to NFPA 18A, Section 7.7 .7 of the 2022 version of that standard. They're a fluorine-free agent with multi-class capabilities, so they're not just locked into a certain fire class. Um, uh, our agent happens to be uh, proven to halt thermal runaway for over 15 years of, of successful uh, testing now. We started in 2008 with Bosch, um, but we have the ability to not only cool the batteries, but we also encapsulate toxic explosive off-gassing as the agent is applied. And that's done inside of something called the, the spherical micelle, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But I want to talk about why encapsulator agents are effective on lithium ion batteries. Now, first one is heat reduction. And heat reduction is the same reason that things like dry chemical, CO2, uh, and other agents like even a foam extinguishers, uh, metals fire extinguishers, the reason they don't work is because they don't reduce the heat. So uh, F500 is excellent at reducing heat. Uh, and for those of you who are big proponents of water, well, guess what? We're still using 97% water. We're just adding 3% of a water additive agent to it to make it perform much, much better. It, it first acts by breaking down the, the, the surface tension of that water, helping it soak in between the cells and the layers of the cells. Um, and then uh, we do some other things as well, but it rapidly reduces heat due to the thermal circuit created by the spherical micelle <clears throat> and helps stop thermal runaway, not only temporarily, but permanently. Uh, toxin reduction. We encapsulate the toxic gases coming off of the fire that promote fire growth and explosion. So if we can knock those down, reduce them significantly, and this product does, especially when you apply it with a fog stream, uh, it really helps reduce those gases that carry a fire forward. Um, prevents reignition, again, by soaking in, getting in between those cells, between the layers of the cells, but it actually encapsulates the hydrocarbon liquid electrolyte and prevents it from reigniting. So it, it really is a, 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 a one-two punch to the fire. And uh, when you treat the batteries post-fire with F500 in a solution and you can keep them wet with it for a little bit, you're gonna prevent reignition. Whereas with plain water, there's been a pretty high prevalence of reignition with all of the other chemical agents, there's been a very high prevalence of reignition. An ABC dry chemical extinguisher will actually knock the fire down for a second or two, but the fire will win out because of the deep seated heat and the electrolyte that keeps spewing out the end of the batteries. <clears throat> um, so uh, overall, it's a very efficient product. It's third party proven uh, by many, many uh, universities, third party testing agencies like DECRA, Kiwa, uh, NEN, et cetera. Um, and uh, uh, it, again, we've been doing this for 15 years with a, a great, great track record of success. <clears throat> well, let's talk about how, let's explore how F500 reacts when it mixes with water in either a sprinkler system, fire hose, et cetera. Encapsulator technology, the next generation of fire and hazard mitigation. First, we start with a simplified version of a single encapsulator agent molecule consisting of a hydrophilic polar head which loves water, dissolves in water, and a hydrophobic nonpolar tail which fears water and will do anything to get away from water. Once the EA molecules enter the water, they instantaneously and automatically orient with the nonpolar tails inward and the polar heads outward, forming millions of spherical micelles. Micelles travel towards and exit the nozzles, forming EA droplets. 
My cells nearest to the surface of each droplet automatically break apart. The nonpolar tails orient outside the droplet with polar heads on the surface, forming an EA skin on the surface of every droplet. In addition to the EA skin, there are millions of molecular spherical micelles within each droplet. So I know you've probably all got tears in your eyes from the Titanic music, but uh, if you can look at this outside blue area is uh, a representative of the outside of the water droplet. Okay, so inside of the water droplet, we've got hundreds of millions of spherical micelles. There's these little golf ball looking things. Um, so the spherical micelles have uh, uh, the, the polar heads of the uh, amphipathic molecule of F500 pointing outward and the tails are pointing inward. On the outside surface of the water droplet, You've got the polar heads facing the water droplet because they love water, and you got the nonpolar tails pointing outwards because they fear water. So what this does is not only sets up a way to encapsulate hydrocarbons, but it also sets up a great thermal circuit because these nonpolar tails absorb heat and drive it into the spherical micelles in a fraction of a second. Um, and then inside of the spherical micelles, as those are formed and flipped inverted uh, inward with the polar tails in, uh, they're capturing gas as they're traveling through the air. They're capturing those carbons and hydrocarbon gases that would, would cause fire development, cause the atmosphere to be toxic. And then when they actually strike a liquid like liquid electrolyte, they encapsulate that as well. So it, it's really... Uh, uh, a very unique chemical reaction that happens within a fraction of a second and puts out fires very, very rapidly uh, and provides rapid cooling as well. And capsule. <clears throat> so a little bit more of a look uh, inside of encapsulator agents. They're fluorine-free, non-corrosive, biodegradable. There's no RICRA reporting chemical reportable chemicals in them at all or anything like that are actually great for cleaning up fuel spills and, and things of that nature. They help uh, break down VOCs and uh, 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 long chain hydrocarbons and capture them and make them palatable to uh, microbes in the soil and water and so forth. So uh, it's a multi-class UL listed agent in Canada and the US. Um, uh, NFPA 18A compliant. Um, it's uh, it, it helps uh, mitigate combustible flammable vapors in confined areas as well as liquid spills. And it's an EPA registered surface washing agent. So we talked about the molecule. The F500 molecule has a polar head and a nonpolar tail, and they're far enough apart that they more or less oppose forces. So you don't have to stir it up. It doesn't settle out. If you tank mix it, it'll stay very, very well diluted evenly throughout the water for a long, long period of time. We get that question a lot with extinguishers and tank mixing it into trucks and so forth. It dilutes itself. Um, <clears throat> but when the, the enough uh, F500 gets into the water, it forms the spherical micelles breaks down the surface tension of the water, helps create smaller droplets, which absorb more heat much more readily. And then the thermal, thermal circuit uh, helps that as well. And locking those hydrocarbons up inside of the spherical micelle is how we keep oxygen separated from the fuel and keep that oxidation from occurring. It's in class D, which isn't listed here, but it does a great job on metals fires as well without reacting. Um, but it does class A, class B, class C fires with a broken stream, uh, and then class D fires as well. So this is a, a test that was done in 2021 at Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute. You may, uh, you may uh, recognize the Hertz name after 
the cycles per second for electricity for AC electricity. But so this is a big electrical uh, uh, study institute named after Heinrich Hertz. So <clears throat> what this is is a, a, a single module out of a larger truck battery. So um, what you're going to see in this video, and I'll, I'll get it to land, so we're not wasting time here. What you're going to see in this video is is thermal runaway beginning. You're going to see the the thermal indicators up on your uh, upper left from the thermal couples climb in temperature. The F500 goes onto the batteries. The temperature drops immediately. The fire goes out and then stays out. <clears throat> and uh, that same pattern occurs over and over and over again in, in really all of our tests that, uh, that we've had is once the F500 is allowed to interface with the cells and the electrolytes, the fire goes out and, and it does stay out. The temperature never rises again. And they monitor it for a significant period of time. We've got the test reports to go with all of these. So if any of you do, and we encourage that, we encourage you to reach out to us if you have questions after this. This is this is a summary of our information. We have many, many tests and documentation to go along with it. Um, we have a lot of information to give you on a one-to-one -one basis as, as needed, and, and we want to give you that information. We want to make sure you have the the information, the services, and, and the equipment that you need. <clears throat> so one of the superpowers of the F500 is encapsulation. It drastically reduces the, the gases available for ignition, as well as it inerts the liquid fuels. Uh, if it's a porous material like wood or fabric, it soaks in uh, and prevents ignition. And as you can see, the spherical micelle up here in the right, top hand of your picture, a representation of that. Polar heads are pointing outward, polar non-polar tails, excuse me, are pointed inwards, and the carbons and hydrocarbons are trapped inside of the spherical micelle. <laughs> and these spherical micelles are very stable in the presence of high heat. You can even run a torch across them and they won't catch back on fire. Rapid heat reduction. It creates a, uh, the F500 creates a protective skin on the water droplet. And then inside the uh, inside of the water droplet is packed these spherical micelles that helps uh, each water droplet have a high molecular density or weight and absorb heat very, very readily to the inside of this each spherical micelle. And it's actually been shown in a study that uh, the, and I don't know how you do this because I'm not a chemist, but the spherical micelles gain weight as they're taking on these carbons and hydrocarbons. <clears throat> um, but that thermal circuit allows uh, the, the high molecular weight F500 water droplet to absorb heat much, much more rapidly, anywhere from, depending on the material, six to 30 times better than plain water. Through a process we call thermal conveyance, in the fire service, we're taught about we're taught about uh, uh, heat transfer through conduction, convection, or radiation. But in the in the chemistry world, in the molecular world, it's thermal conveyance. <clears throat> and then the third superpower is free radical interruption. So in the next video, you're going to observe that high molecular weight water droplet. Uh, in combination with the encapsulation, uh, interrupt the coalescence of free radicals. When we have incomplete combustion here on the surface of the earth, what's created is free radicals coming off in the form of imbalanced electrons on, excuse me, atoms with imbalanced electrons. And they're seeking balance. So they made up with all the other free radicals from the other chemicals and uh, they form a whole rainbow of, of new chemical compounds or volatile organic compounds. And that creates what we see as soot and smoke. Those volatile organic compounds are flammable, like carbon monoxide, for example. They're toxic, like hydrogen cyanide, for example. 
and they carry the fire forward. Um, so, and, and they help the fire grow. So if we can eliminate that, we increase visibility, we keep the fire from being able to grow, and we knock down the toxicity of the fire. And it even if you, for example, and we have studies to back this up as well, use it on an interior fire attack for a structure, it reduces a carcinogen accumulation on firefighters turnout gear. So watch this next video and really pay attention to uh, not only how fast the fire goes out, but really pay attention above the tires in the smoke column and see how fast it disappears once the F500 hits the tires. <clears throat> You see right there, that smoke is gone. We've interrupted that chain reaction, uh, the coalescence of free radicals. It also, as we progress through this fire attack, it cools that hot rubber and steel belts very, very quickly, and they're able to go up and handle them really, really fast. Now that, what you might think is steam, that, that water vapor that's coming off of there is at a much lower temperature than steam in plain water. So it doesn't scald, doesn't burn your lungs. It's got the free radicals and, and all that captured, uh, much lower toxins. We still want you to use your SCBA like you always would because we can't predict what's going to happen every second. But uh, 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 it really, really does make a difference. It vaporizes at a much lower temperature than, than water. It, it's like a warm shower. It's actually comfortable. <clears throat> Also absorbs heat much more uniformly than water. Only about uh, three to eight percent of water is actually used for cooling. The rest runs off without cooling. This this is almost a hundred percent efficient. <clears throat> the results of of uh, using F five hundred. In that environment, we can result in a lab at least uh, up to a 97% decrease in toxic soot production, 98.6% decrease in toxic smoke production, and a visibility increase of 70%. You don't get quite those results in the field because of you know it's not a perfect application, but we do have lots of testing to show that this is happening across the board with all of the VOCs coming off of that fire, the cancer causing VOCs, the, the VOCs that make the fire grow. <clears throat> so uh, Clemson University did a study back in 2006 and they're the ones that, that determined that we are reducing uh, those carcinogens in the smoke by 98.6%. So it includes these chemicals that they measured. We have another study by Laval uh, Fire Department in Canada and Ottawa University that shows this across a much wider range of chemicals uh, in an interior structure fire attack, which we'd love to show you sometime. For superpower, it's eco-friendly. So there's no PFOA or PFAS. PFAS is introduced into foam on purpose to make it make the bubble structure stable in the presence of polar solvents and, and gasoline and so forth. So the bubble structure stays strong, but our chemical F500 readily mixes with water and we want it to. So PFAS would be a detriment to its performance. There's no PFAS in it. Gel Labs has determined that there's no uh, uh, fluorine detected or fluorinated chemicals detected that would be deemed harmful to human health. 
Uh, there's actually more fluorine concentration in most of your municipal water supplies than there ever would be in our product. And the only case that there would be detectable fluorines is if you mixed it with municipal water. So <clears throat> got uh, those kind of tests available too for anybody that, that wants them. Um, we've got over a decade of third-party testing uh, referenced in NFPA 18A, Annex 4.3, and also NEN, uh, the Dutch standard NTA 8133, which I'll touch on here shortly. And uh, uh, we're getting uh, nearer the end of our, our uh, presentation. So make sure you guys uh, hopefully are putting some questions into chat now. Uh, we don't want to forget your question or get you passed by. So please put your questions into chat. And then once we uh, uh, get to the end of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. <clears throat> so there's a Dutch standard uh, uh, called NTA or excuse me, NEN, which is similar to our NFPA over uh, here in the U.S., but it's uh, NEN NTA 8133. It was developed in 2021, and it's the first published standard that deals with lithium-ion batteries specifically, and it deals with lithium-ion batteries up to 600 watt-hours for things like smartphones, laptops, power tools, etc., um, and it was prepared by a working group, uh, numerous tests with different chemical agents, and uh, and they determined, like everybody else, uh, lithium ion batteries don't really fall into a specific class that uh, is is traditionally in line with our current classes. So they more or less recognized that early on and made a standard around that. NFPA is considering naming a new class itself. But the test set up here was a 3.7 volt lithium ion battery or a series of them. And the, the objective of the uh, test was they would set the batteries on fire on one end and then you had to stop the thermal runaway before it, it transmitted through all of the batteries. And F500 capsulator agent was able to both extinguish the lithium ion battery fire and stop the thermal runaway. And if you look at the test setup over here on the right, I don't know why the arrow is pointing down there, but uh, if you look at the test setup over here on the right, uh, it clearly stopped the thermal runaway uh, at, at the uh, fourth battery. So it passed the test and meets that standard. So this is uh, that same uh, truck battery module we looked at earlier except for now there's 10 modules. So we start a couple of them on fire with glow plugs. And these are 18650 cells, just packed tightly together in these modules. I'm gonna advance this one forward a little bit. <clears throat> and in this test, uh, it has a sprinkler system there but the sprinkler heads are offset, so they're not directly impinging on it. So they wanted to demonstrate that even without, you know, a real super direct stream of F500, that it would still be functional. And, and it very much is, as you'll see. So although the, the video doesn't run, you know, super long afterwards, the test reports did confirm that the battery went out and stayed out like it was supposed to. So <clears throat> right now, F500 is in use at facilities with all of these major manufacturers, and that that's growing every day. Uh, we get phone calls every day from people that are manufacturing with 
lithium ion batteries who are curious about F500 and what it can do for them to protect their research and development facilities as they as they take their units into the field and, and do field trials and so forth, and as well in their facilities as they realize that, well, our brand new forklifts are all lithium ion battery powered too. Maybe we should do something about that. So, uh, uh, and then charging facilities, uh, uh, when you're manufacturing vehicles, you gotta keep up with battery modules and charging them and all that. So we protect that side of the, the house as well. <clears throat> so talk a little bit about uh, facility protection, handheld protection, et cetera, with F500. Um, so buildings and facilities, uh, we look at it from a detection aspect. We want you to be able to detect the fire very, very quickly, keep small fires small. When it comes to like battery energy storage systems, et cetera, that's, that's especially critical. Um, extinguish with F500 encapsulator technology. What you're seeing here in the picture on the right is what we call our diamond doser. It's a water-driven proportioner. And we've got totes of F500 on a catchment basin, feeds into the, the diamond doser. It's water-driven. There's no power required other than water movement as water moves through the sprinkler riser, powers this water motor, and proportions agent into the system appropriately for the hazard that's protecting. <clears throat> so uh, we can also do what's called VEEP or vapor encapsulation explosion prevention in a ex potentially gaseous explosion, explosion uh, 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 hazard type environment. <clears throat> Battery energy storage system, grid protection. Um, so we not only protect and are, are uh, working on designs with and for uh, manufacturers of battery energy storage systems, uh, but we also protect transformers and have for years and years. So uh, it's engineered control panels uh, that help detect fire early in each module of a battery energy storage system. And then when that uh, particular module, or if you think of it as a computer rack and each, each item in the computer rack is another rack of batteries, we do it down to the, the individual uh, component level. We can detect that fire early, get the component put out while it's still small, great. Then we also have the general system that covers the entire uh, unit. Uh, so if we, for whatever reason, maybe get struck by lightning or a, a, who knows, a missile hits it, uh, we can put it out generally as well as individual. Um, uh, so it's in rack, module level, enclosure level, and also transformer. Uh, in a transformer, you've got hot oil, three-dimensional fire. Uh, we we frequently uh, are used to extinguish those as well as uh, in both fixed systems and in manual firefighting. <clears throat> Again, we can we can encapsulate those gases inside of that unit, and that's part of the generalized uh, system at the enclosure level. Um, as uh, fire grows and produces gases, we can detect those gases and and activate the general system to keep the gases down and keep it from exploding on responders. <clears throat> and then, when it comes to manual firefighting. We assist and train the fire service with planning, equipping, and training them for uh, lithium ion battery fires, whether it be uh, scooters, uh, battery energy storage systems, electric vehicles, whatever the situation may be, we help fire departments plan, equip, and train for that hazard. <clears throat> and, and this is really where we would love you to contact us through our distributors or directly so that we can work with you one-on-one -on -one to, to answer your, your concerns, help you figure out your path forward so that you're ready for this uh, new and growing threat. Our mobile detection that we're developing uh, along with some partners will go on equipment, whether it be heavy equipment, trucks, et cetera, built-in equipment to help extinguish fires on board those units uh, as they're working. Our handheld equipment that we, we distribute as well to, to help 
as, as tools for application for lithium ion battery fires includes our FLIR camera uh, line, uh, both handheld and we have fixed units to go in battery energy storage systems and so forth as well. Uh, F500 handheld extinguishers for pretty much any type of facility, wheeled uh, extinguishers, which we call our quick attack mobile units, up to 100 liters in size. Our TKO nozzles, which uh, go on the end of a firefighting hose, they're, they're, they're great for not only smaller nuisance fires or if you have standpipes in your, in your manufacturing facility or other facility, they're also great for, for deconning hose, equipment, et cetera. <clears throat> and then uh, TFT nozzles. Uh, this is a, called the TFT transformer. It's, an, uh, it's a piercing nozzle, but it's also got an under, under car uh, distributor nozzle uh, so that you can directly apply it to the battery module and help cool that battery down, which has been very effective when you put F500 in there. Uh, this is a 150 GPM nozzle, but you can probably turn it down you don't probably even need quite that much. It's it's hard to support, you know, a lot of GPM when you're away from a hydrant area, maybe out on a on a rural highway or interstate somewhere. Uh, so <clears throat> very very nice tool. Um, uh, you can stick it in the car window, turn it on. It puts out a heck of a lot of fire as well as put it under the car. Puts out a heck of a lot of fire, and, and like I always tell people, an EV an EV car fire is a two line fire, not a one line fire. So you're gonna have one there attacking the main vehicle. You can slide something under it, to cool that battery pack too, as soon as possible. You're gonna give it a you're gonna give it a double whammy and and get ahead of it. <clears throat> so uh, I really had an enjoyable time uh, presenting to you all, and and I hope you have a a, a great day and a great week. Oh,